All right, hey folks, in this video we're going to look at uh, partial derivatives and uh, what's called second order partial derivatives. It's not going to be it's not going to be too bad. The uh, objectives we're going to focus on here, well the first one is going to be, um, you know, how do we compute a partial derivative? And then the second one is going to be, uh, yeah, well, you know, it's applied calculus. So once we can compute a partial derivative, we're going to apply a partial derivative to talk about marginal revenue. Then we're going to look at computing uh, marginal productivity of labor and capital. And uh, finally, we're going to look at uh, second order partial derivatives. So let's get started. Remember back in section 8.2, uh, we looked at, uh, we briefly looked at vertical cross sections of these surfaces in space. And uh, we said vertical cross sections were formed when you take a vertical plane, either uh, of the form x equals c or y equals c, and uh, you slice the surface um, in three space. And the, the resulting curve is what was called a vertical cross section. Um, Another way to look at it, and it's going to be important as we uh, start to introduce the concept of partial derivatives, is that we keep one of the independent variables constant. And the vertical cross section that we're left with is just a function of one variable. Let's see how this plays out in an example. Um, there was a toy manufacturer in section 8.2. Um, don't know if I recall that or not, but it doesn't matter. We, we see the production function for this toy manufacturer is given by Q equals F of X, Y, which equals 4.28 X to the 0 0.8 and Y to the 0 0.2. Q is the number of toys that are made each week. X is the number of labor hours each week. And Y is the uh, weekly usage of capital investment. If the number of labor hours is fixed at x equals 8, so if the number of labor hours is just kept constant at x equals 8, then how fast is the number of toys produced? How fast is that increasing? As you know, the capital increases from a level of 7. So right now we're saying, hey, we're using 8 hours, 8, eight units of labor hours and 7 units of capital. Let's keep the number of units of labor hours fixed at x equals 8. What's that doing to the number of toys that's being produced, um, you know, if we allow the capital to increase? Well, you know what we're going to do? You better write all this stuff down uh, because, you know, I'm going to head off to the chalkboard and work through this example. So write it down because here I go heading off to the chalkboard. All right, hey folks, here in this first example, uh, didn't write down all the words. Hopefully, you know, you, you have it written down. Uh, this is the production function that was given for uh, a toy manufacturer. Q represents the number of toys made each week. X is the number of labor hours, and Y is um, the weekly usage of capital investments. Now, the question said, if the number of labor hours is fixed at X equals 8, how fast is the number of toys produced increasing as the capital increases from a level of 7? So, so let's just think about this for a minute. Labor hours is fixed at x equals 8. So we're being told x is 8. So let's go ahead and, uh, let's go ahead and toss an 8 in for the x. We don't know what y is. Whoops. Putting that 8 in for that x. Alright, and now we're being asked, how fast is the number of toys produced increasing as capital increases from a level of 7? So look at what we have here, folks. We put 8 in place of x, 8's in place of x. We now have a function, just look at this junk over here. We have a function of just one variable. The only variable there is y. This is a constant, and this is a constant. I mean, this is a big, ugly constant. But the only variable is y. We can differentiate this beastie with respect to y. In fact, let me make this note right now. We can differentiate this with respect to y. I mean, you know how to get that derivative. You bring the point 2 out front and subtract 1 from the exponent. So you'd have a 4.28 times 
times 8 to the 0 0.80 times 0 0.20. Y, and now you subtract 1 from the exponent, and that gives you a negative, I think 0.2 minus 1 is a negative 0.8. So to answer the question, how fast is the number of toys increasing? Uh, how, how fast is the number of toys produced increasing uh, when the, the capital level is at 7? So you're being told Y is 7. So when capital Y is 7, all you have to do is put a 7 in here for the Y. Now yeah, let's do that. Gives you a 4.28. 8 to the 0 0.80, 0 0.20, 8 to the negative 0 0.80. And aren't we happy we, we have a calculator to crank through all this gory calculations? And I think we get approximately, um, when I do this on my calculator, I get 0.856. So we just did something that isn't new, computing a derivative. We computed a derivative. That's not new. That's not a new concept. But what we're going to do now is we're going to head back to the slides to kind of summarize what we did, and it's going to serve as our introduction into what is called a partial derivative. All right, folks. Hey, let's summarize what we did in that example. Um, what we did in that example was we held x constant at x equals 8. And that produced a vertical cross section of the of the surface. Remember, the surface is the graph that would be taking place in uh, three dimensions in three space. So we we held x constant at x equals eight. It produced a vertical cross section, and the graph of that cross section would be living in the y z plane. And all it's doing is it's just showing the production of toys as a function of one variable, that variable being y, because x is being held constant at 8. So it would be showing the different production um, that would be happening if uh, we let the uh, uh, capital change. We saw that we could differentiate that function of one variable, and it gave us a rate of change. And the process of holding x constant and then moving along in the y direction and determining the rate of change, that's one interpretation of what is known as the partial derivative of f with respect to y. So holding x constant, that's one interpretation. Similarly, we didn't, but we could have held y constant at some value and moved in the x direction and then find the rate of change, that would be an, an one interpretation of what's called the partial derivative with respect to x. So keeping y constant, that's a partial derivative with respect to x. Well, I think it's time for us to look at uh, what, how we can define these partial derivatives. So we'll call this like a basic definition of partial derivatives. Uh, f of x, y is a function of two variables. The partial derivative of f with respect to x is given by, um, well, there it is. Um, on the left side, I read that as uh, the partial with respect to x. And it doesn't surprise us at all that we should be seeing, I mean, it's a definition of a derivative, this goes all the way back to our definition of the derivative. But notice the difference here. It says limit as h approaches 0, um, f of x plus h comma y minus f of x, y all over h. Uh, remember the definition of the derivative that we saw way back in chapter 2, section 2.4, I believe. Uh, that was a function of one variable. And um, it said the limit as h approaches 0 f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Well, here, I want you to just notice that in the numerator where it says f of uh, x plus h comma y, y is constant. Only the x is changing by that little bitty piece called h. The 
partial derivative with respect to y is given by, well, there it is. Um, on the left side, I read that as partial with respect to y. And here, notice it's the limit as h approaches 0, f of x comma y plus h minus f of x, y all over h. So notice x is constant, and the y is changing by that little bitty piece h. And just like we saw before, each of these partial derivatives exists only if the appropriate limit exists. So I'm sure you all remember the fun we had way back at the beginning in section 2.4 of using the definition of the derivative to compute derivatives by hand the long way. Um, I'm sure you all remember that. And I'm sure right now you're thinking, oh, man, are we going to be doing that again? And the answer is no. Um, Here's how we are going to compute partial derivatives. Uh, first off, I'm going to say the partial derivative with respect to x, I can't stress enough, it is found by treating y as a constant. Um, and if we do that, if we just pretend y is a constant, then we can use our regular ordinary differentiation techniques. We don't have to go the long route. Uh, we can use the, the shortcuts that we already know, you know, the power rule, the product rule all those great rules. The notation for the partial with respect to x, well, we just saw it in the definition. Um, uh, you know, x is in a subscript position. Some people like to use um, this Leibniz type notation. Um, I just put it in here because I think it looks cool. Those are cool symbols. Um, the units of this partial derivative are units of f per units of x. And then likewise, the partial derivative with respect to y it's important to remember the partial with respect to y. You can do this by just treating x as a constant and then do your regular ordinary differentiation rules. So we are not going to be uh, cranking through that onerous uh, definition of the derivative uh, that we saw on the prior slide. We are going to just simply um, use the differentiation techniques we already know. Uh, but before I go to the next slide, one more time. When you get the partial with respect to x, you are going to treat the variable y as a constant and then differentiate like you normally do. When you get the partial derivative with respect to y, you're going to treat x as a constant and do the normal differentiation that you, that you normally do. So let's see. Let's look at this example. Uh, f of x, y equals 4x squared minus square root y plus x, y. In part a, determine the partial with respect to x of x, y. And in part b, determine the partial with respect to y of x, y. Uh, before I head off to the chalkboard, let me just say one more time. In part a, to do the partial with respect to x, in my function, wherever I see a y, I'm going to treat it as a constant and differentiate like I normally would. In part b, when I do the partial with respect to y, wherever I see an x, I'm going to treat it like a constant and then differentiate like I normally would. So write this down because it's time for me to head off to the chalkboard and work through this example. So here we go to the chalkboard. Hey right, folks, here's the example we left off with. And uh, before we do this, you know, the, the slide right before this example, we talked about the process of computing a partial derivative. And uh, you're going to hear me say this, babble this, as I'm computing partial derivatives. In other words, we're computing the partial derivative with respect to x. When you do the partial derivative with respect to x, whenever you see a y, you're just going to treat it as a constant. And you remember the derivative of a constant is, is 0. So let's see what we get here. Partial with respect to x. So the derivative of the first term, 2 comes out front. So I get an 8x. Partial with respect to x, I'm treating y as a constant. So this y is nothing more than a constant. What's the derivative of a constant? That's right, it's 0. Plus, now we have x times y. This isn't a product rule here. 
because y is being treated as a constant. I mean, think if, if y were actually the number 4. You'd say, well, the derivative of 4x is, is 4. So the derivative of x times y, if you're treating y as a constant, we know the derivative of x is 1. 1 times that constant is the constant. So the partial with respect to x is 8x plus y. Now we're going to do in part b the partial with respect to y. When you do the partial with respect to y, you treat x as if it were a constant. So look at the first term. Everything in the first term, when we do the partial with respect to y, everything in the first term is treated as a constant. Derivative of a constant is? That's right, it's 0. Move to the next term. Oh, well, that derivative is, I shouldn't forget the negative sign, 1 half y to the negative 1 half. The third term, we're doing the partial with respect to y, so we're treating x as a constant. So when we do the derivative, the derivative of y is 1, so we have x times 1, because that's a constant. We just get x. Okay, so the key in doing partial derivatives, when you do the partial with respect to x, whenever you see the variable y, treat it as a constant. When you do the partial with respect to y, whenever you see the variable x, you treat it as a constant. So to make sure you have this under control, uh, doing these partial derivatives, I'm going to want you to pause the video, and I'd like you to do numbers 9, uh, number 13, and also number 15. So there are three of them I want you to do right now to practice doing these partial derivatives. So go ahead, pause the video, do numbers 9, 13, and 15. When you're done, well, you know the drill. Restart the video, and I'll be here at the chalkboard working through the solutions. All right, let's see if you got number 9. Hopefully you did. To do the uh, partial with respect to x, you're going to treat every y you see as a constant. So I look at the first term, I treat y as a constant. Well, 2 is a constant, so it looks like my uh, derivative with respect to x is a 2y. And oh, that's a constant, derivative is 0, and that's obviously a constant to the derivative of 0. So the partial with respect to x is just 2y. Partial with respect to y. All right, so here, wherever I see an x, I'm going to treat it as a constant. So 2 is a constant, x is a constant. Um, it looks like the derivative of the first term would just be a 2x. The derivative of the second term is minus 2y, and then the derivative of 1 is 0. So hopefully for number 9, you get the partial with respect to x to be a 2y, and the partial with respect to y to be 2x minus y. All right, hey, number 13, um, let's see if you got this, partial with respect to x. So again, when I do the partial with respect to x, I treat y as a constant. So it starts off with the 2x. See, that's a constant. So the derivative of 3x squared is 6x. So I have 6xy cubed. That's a, oh, everything there is a constant. So the derivative is, uh, is well, the derivative is 0. And uh, see, that's a constant. Derivative of x is 1. So I'd have a minus y. So hopefully you have the partial with respect to x as being 2x plus 6xy cubed minus y. Okay, now the partial with respect to y, okay, we're going to treat x as a constant. So, well, that's 0. See, this is a constant, and the derivative of y cubed is 3y squared. So 3x squared times 3y squared is a 9x squared y squared uh, minus a 6 y squared, and then uh, see x is a constant, so well, that's just a minus x. So hopefully you got that for the partial with respect to y. So hopefully you got number 9, hopefully you got number 13, and uh, let's see if you got number 15. 
All right, here number 15, let's see if you got it. The partial with respect to x. You know, I'm going to treat y as a constant. So it starts off as 6x squared, constant, derivative of 0, plus 2. And the derivative of the constant down there is 0. So uh, that's the partial with respect to x. Partial with respect to y, I'm going to treat x as a constant. So that's 0. So I have a minus 2y, all constants, 0, 0. So that's just it for the partial with respect to y, is negative 2y. Hopefully you're getting the hang of this, and you see it's really nothing different than we've been doing, you know, going back to, um, you know, September. So, um, you know what it's time to do now that we've uh, looked at the mechanics of doing partial derivatives. It's time to head back to the slides and look at another example. This example will be... Well, you know, it's going to be an application. It's time for us to, um, to look at how to apply these partial derivatives. All right, hey folks, um, uh, I hope that example makes sense and I hope uh, uh, you were starting to feel kind of comfortable doing this by working through numbers 9, 13, and 15. Uh, as promised, it's time for us to, well, look at an application. Uh, so a lot of words here, you know, you might want to write all these down, you know, to, to, to because you know when I head off to the chalkboard. Um, but we're at Rory's Deli. And um, Rory's Deli you know, plans to increase the normal inventory of turkeys and hams for the holidays. They've determined the daily price demand equation for turkeys is given by P equals 24 minus 0.3x minus 0.1y. And the daily price demand equation for hams is given by Q equals 22 minus 0.1x minus 0.2y. And here X is the demand for turkeys, Y is the demand for hams, P is the price per turkey, and Q is the price per ham, and those prices are in dollars. So the first thing we're going to do is determine the revenue function. And once we have the revenue function, we're going to determine R of 8, 6, um, the partial with respect to x evaluated at 8.6, and the partial with respect to y evaluated at 8.6, and we're going to interpret all three of those. So again, make sure you have all this written down, because I'm not going to write down nearly all these words on the chalkboard. Um, make sure you have it all written down. Pause if you need to. Um, but I think it's time to head off to the chalkboard, and let's crank through this example. All right, folks, on so this example, hopefully you wrote down everything because I'm not writing all those words down again. I just wrote down some of the important pieces. Uh, for example, P, uh, P equals 24 minus 0.3x minus 0.1y. That was the price demand equation for turkeys. And uh, uh, the price demand equation for the hams was Q equals 22 minus 0.1x minus 0.2y. Uh, X, was the, um, X was the demand for turkeys, and Y was the demand for hams. And then, uh, well, also I mentioned that P is uh, price per turkey, and Q is price per ham, and those prices are in dollars. So part A, you're asked to find the revenue function as a function of two variables, X and Y. Well, nothing's changed about revenue. It doesn't matter if there's two variables or one variable. Revenue is always price times quantity. So we have the price, we have the price for the turkeys, and we know X is the, well, the quantity demanded of turkeys. So if I take price times quantity, that's X times 24 minus 0.3X minus 0.1Y. This is the piece that tells me what's happening for the turkeys. But we also have hams. And again, the little piece for the revenue for the hams is price times quantity. It's price times the quantity. So I should add to the turkey, I should add the ham. So there is the revenue function for um, as a function of two variables. I'm going to clean this up. I'm going to simplify this. I'm going to simplify it as much as I can because looking ahead to part B, 
Um, I'm going to do some partial derivatives, and I think it's going to help me to have the to have the, the revenue function simplified just in doing the partial derivatives. But it's not too bad to simplify. I mean, you know, distribute the x. So you have a 24x minus a 0.3x squared minus a 0.1xy. Go ahead and distribute the y. So you have a 22y minus a 0.1xy minus 0.2y squared. And go ahead and combine any like terms you have. And you get a 24x minus 0.3x squared minus 0.2xy, is this term in this term, plus a 22y minus a 0.2y squared. So this is the simplified version of the revenue function uh, that I'm going to use. And this is the, the simplified version I'm going to use in part B. But in order to do part B, it looks like I've run out of space on the old chalkboard, so I'm going to have to do a little erasing. So uh, if you have to pause the video to write anything down, well, now would be a good time because uh, I'm going to erase. Okay, I just, e I just erased the revenue function, but I'm going to let me write it down again. From part A, we have the revenue function 24x minus 0.3x squared minus a 0.2xy plus a 22y minus 0.2y squared. Okay, part B, we're asked to determine r of 8 comma 6. The partial with respect to x evaluated at 8, 6, and the partial with respect to y evaluated at 8, 6. And it says here to interpret each one. Well, let's start off by doing the R of 8, 6. So I put an 8 in for all the X's. I put a 6 in for all the Y's. I crank it through my calculator, and I get 288. So what that means that if you sell, or if this place, Rory's Deli, uh, sells eight turkeys and six hams, the revenue is $288. So the revenue on selling of the eight turkeys and six hams, that revenue is $288. Okay, now I have to do the partial with respect to X evaluated at 8, 6. Well, in order to do that, we have to first get the partial with respect to X. Makes sense? So let's get the partial with respect to X. Remember one more time, when you do the partial with respect to X, you're going to treat Y as a constant. So, uh, see, that's a 24 minus, uh, well, 0.6x uh, minus, remember y is a constant, so it's a 0.2y, uh, and all those are zeros. So, when we evaluate this at 8, 6, we put an 8 in for the x, we put a 6 in for the y, and when I do that and crank that through the calculator, I get 18. Now it says interpret. And I'm going to write down an abbreviated interpretation here, what this 18 means. It means, well, first off, the 8 and the 6. Rory's Deli is selling uh, 8 turkeys and 6 hams. So let me write that down. Rory's Deli is selling 8 turkeys and 6 hams. And now, this is the key part here. Um, the number of hams being sold is held constant at 6. When you do the partial with respect to x, you're treating y as a constant. So this, the y is a constant. So when 8 turkeys and 6 hams are sold, and the hams are held constant, 
I'll say at six, revenue is increasing at a rate of, let's see, these are dollars, so at a rate of $18, now we expect units here because it's a derivative. So it's increasing at a rate of $18 per per turkey. That's the variable that's changing. It's the, the, the variable x, which represented the number of turkeys being sold. So one more time real quick. x is turkeys. Y is hams, eight and six. There are eight turkeys and six hams that are being sold. Y, when you do the partial with respect to X, Y is being held constant. So the number of hams being sold is being held constant at six. So when eight turkeys and six hams uh, are being sold and the number of hams is being held constant at six, revenue is increasing at a rate of $18 per turkey. Really what this is, I mean, it's basically telling us, I'm going to use an old word here, it's telling us the marginal revenue for the turkeys. That's what it's telling us. Ham's being held constant. So it's just telling us the marginal revenue for the turkeys. And, uh, well, let's finish this example off. We're supposed to evaluate uh, the partial with respect to y at 8, 6. So in order to do that, we first need to get the partial with respect to y. Remember, when you do the partial with respect to y, you treat x as a constant. So that would be 0, that would be 0, that will give me a negative 0.2x plus a 22 minus 0.4y. And let's see, oh, I need to evaluate that at 8, 6. So I toss an 8 in for the x, the 6 in for the y. And, well, that's kind of trippy. I get 18. So let's think about what this interpretation would be. When Roy's Deli is selling eight turkeys and six hams, and what's being held constant here? Well, partial with respect to y, x is being held constant. So the number of turkeys being sold is being held constant at 8. So when Roy's Deli is selling 8 turkeys and 6 hams and the number of turkeys being sold is held constant at 8, revenue is increasing at a rate of $18 per ham. So again, old words here. It's like the partial with respect to y is telling us the marginal revenue for hams. Partial with respect to X was the marginal revenue for turkeys. Partial with respect to Y is the marginal, uh, marginal revenue for, for the hams. And I'm not going to write that down. You know, you can replay what I just said. You can write it down. All I know is after doing this problem, I'm kind of hungry. But, um, hey, let's head on back to the slides. I think we have another application to look at that's not going to involve hams and turkeys because, you know, I'm too hungry to, to talk about that right now. All right. Hey, hopefully you saw in that example. It wasn't too bad. And, um, you know, I even brought in the marginal revenue language at the end there. Uh, but hopefully you saw in the interpretation, one of the key parts was to interpret which variable was being held constant and at what value it was being held constant at. Um, you know, before we, uh, before we scoot on and look at marginal productivity of uh, labor and capital, I thought we'd do one, uh, oh, you know, non-business type example. Um, looking at a box. So we have a, a rectangular solid that has a square base, and its volume is given by x squared y. x is the length of the side of the square base, and y is the height. I don't have any units here, so I'm not worried about units. Determine uh, via 5.8 the partial with respect to x evaluated at 5.8 and the partial with respect to y at 5.8 and interpret each. Um, so why don't you write this down and uh, hey, let's head off to the chalkboard and crank through this example. All right, hey folks, the example we just left off with was uh, one that said the volume of a rectangular solid with a square base 
uh, is given by this formula, volume uh, being x squared y. x is the length of the side of the square base, and y is the height. Uh, determine the v of 5, 8, partial with respect to x of 5, 8, and partial with respect to y of 5, 8, and interpret each. Well, here we go. V of 5, 8. You know this is an old problem. You put 5 in for the x, 8 in for the y, and you get 200. Quick interpretation of that. Uh, box a 5, I'm going to say a 5 by 5 by 8 box as a volume of 200, and since it's volume, the units would be cubic units. So I mean, if each of these were inches, it would be 200 cubic inches. All right, so now the partial with respect to x, evaluated at 5, 8. Well, we first have to get the partial with respect to x, then we can evaluate it at 5, 8. And again, remember when you do the partial with respect to x, you treat y as a constant. So uh, y is a constant, looks like the partial with respect to x is just a 2xy. And when we evaluate that at 5, 8, put a 5 in for x, 8 in for the y, and you get 80. And I don't know what the units are, I didn't put units on this example. Um, so what's, what's the interpretation here? Well, it, re it tells me, first of all, x partial with respect to x, y is constant. So it tells me that uh, when you have a solid with a base, it's a 5 by 5 base, and a height of 8. So again, I don't know what the units are, they could be inches. So you have a solid with a base that's 5 by 5 and a height of 8 and the height is held constant at 8. Partial with respect to x, y is constant. That's constant. We're treating it as a constant. The volume is increasing at a rate of 80 cubic units per, well, I don't know what the units are. I don't know what the units are for x and y. I mean, if they were inches, it would be 80 cubic inches per, per inch. Let's do the partial with respect to y. Partial with respect to y. You're going to treat x as a constant. So x is a constant. Derivative of y is 1, so we just get that to be x squared. When you evaluate that, we're evaluating it at 5, 8. Put a 5 in for the x, 8 in for the y. Well, there is no y, so put 5 in for the x and you get 25. So let's think about what the interpretation is for this. When you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be basically the same. You got a solid with a base uh, that's 5 by 5, and the height is 8. So let's start that off the same. A solid with a base of 5 by 5, and a height of 8. And here, the base is held constant the base is held constant at 5 by 5. Now how do we know that? Because you're doing the partial with respect to y. When you do the partial with respect to y, you keep x constant. x was the dimensions of the base. So we're keeping the base constant. The volume 
is increasing at a rate of 25 cubic units for whatever the other unit is. And again, don't have any units here. Try to keep it as generic as possible. Okay, so the key thing, we've done two examples now. The key thing when you evaluate a partial derivative and interpret is that there's that extra little piece. You're interpreting which variable is being held constant and what that means. So we've done two examples of those. And uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to head back to the slides and we're going to look at very, very specific uh, business type applications of partial derivatives. We're going to go look at what's called, and this goes back to our Cobb-Douglas production function, uh, marginal productivity of labor and marginal productivity of capital. So let's head back to the slides and see what that's all about. And then I'm sure we'll be back here at the chalkboard to do an example. All right, hey, we looked at that example of the volume one. Now it's time to come back to some of the more, some more of our, um, you know, hardcore type business type applications. Um, two that we're going to focus on here, these are kind of cool, are, uh, they're called marginal productivity of labor and marginal productivity of capital. And quite simply, for any production function that you have, and you see the production function I have listed here, uh, when X represents units of labor, and y represents units of capital, then the partial with respect to x, that's called marginal productivity of labor. And what it does is it, is it gives an approximate change in productivity per unit change in labor. So think of what you, partial with respect to x, y would be held constant. So you'd be keeping capital constant. And it's kind of telling you, if you just do a little bit more with the labor, uh, what's the change in productivity? That's why it's called marginal productivity of labor. The partial with respect to Y, well, that's called mar marginal productivity of capital. And it gives the approximate change in productivity per a unit change in capital. So think about, you're talking the, mar the, the, the partial with respect to Y. So you're keeping X constant. You're keeping units of labor constant, and you're seeing what's the little bit of change in productivity uh, as capital changes. So, yeah, let's see if we have an example for this. And we do. It says here, Rapid Bikes has a Cobb-Douglas production function that's given by uh, Q equals 13, X to the 0.25, Y to the 0.75. X is the utilization of labor and Y is the utilization of capital. And Q is the number of bicycles produced. So let's see what we're gonna do here. Oh, part A, we're gonna find the marginal productivity of labor and marginal productivity of capital. We're gonna find the partial with respect to X and the partial with respect to Y. And then in part B, we're going to evaluate the marginal productivity of labor at x equals 5 and y equals 10, and we're going to interpret that. So in part B, we're going to evaluate the partial with respect to x at 5 comma 10, and we're going to interpret that. So make sure you have all this written down. Pause the video if you need to to write everything down here, um, because here I go. I'm heading off to the chalkboard to crank through this example. Hey folks, the example we left off with, I uh, was talking about rapid bikes. Here's a production function for them. X is utilization of labor and Y is utilization of capital. And uh, Q is the number of bicycles produced. So in part A, you're asked to compute marginal productivity of labor and marginal productivity of capital. So you're asked to compute the partial with respect to X. That is your marginal productivity of labor. So we do the marginal productivity of labor. That's the partial with respect to x. Uh, we treat y as a constant. So we get 13 times 0 0.25 x to the negative 0 0.75. And then y to the 0 0.75. Because you're treating y as a constant. Marginal productivity of capital. That's the partial with respect to y. So partial derivative with respect to y, that's marginal productivity of capital. We're going to treat x as a constant. 
So we're treating x as a constant. All of this is being treated as a constant. So it's 13. So I just differentiate this piece. The 0.75 comes out front. And then we'd subtract 1 from that exponent. And it gives me that mess. So now part B, we're asked to evaluate the marginal productivity of labor at x equals 5 and y equals 10 and interpret. So evaluate marginal productivity of labor. Well, that's this one. At x equals 5 and y equals 10. So we're going to we're going to put 5 in here for x and a 10 in for the y. And I'm so happy to have a calculator. When I crank this through my calculator, I get something pretty close to 5.4658. All right, so now what does that mean? What's the interpretation? Well, let's start off with the 5 and the 10. Um, we know that's labor. And that's capital. So let's get that under control. Five units of labor and ten units of capital. And let's see, partial with respect to x, that means we treated y as a constant. So capital. Capital is held constant at 10 units. We're making bikes here. So the number, the number of bikes produced is, well, it's a positive number, so it's increasing at a rate of, I'm going to round that, uh, I'm going to round it to 5.5, at a rate of about 5.5 bikes per, now what's it per? 100 units of labor. Okay, I'm saying 100 units of labor because originally in the, uh, in the example it said uh, X is utilization of labor and Y is utilization of capital and both, both of those are in hundreds, so that's why I tacked it on there. But the key, here's the key thing. It doesn't matter if we call it marginal productivity of labor or marginal productivity of capital. Marginal productivity of labor, that's the partial with respect to X. We're treating Y as a constant. So in our interpretation, we make sure to get that in there, that the variable y, which is capital, is held constant. So let's see. Um, we are now going to, what do I have next? Oh, we're going to head back to the slides. We're going to head back to the slides, and we're going to extend this a little bit. It's called second order partial derivatives. It's not that bad. We're just doing derivatives of derivatives. Uh, but let's go look at the slide to see what it's all about. Then I'm sure we'll come here and do an example of doing second order partial derivatives. All right, hey, hopefully you uh, understood the marginal productivity example we just cranked through. Uh, time to look at our final concept in this section. Uh, the final one is called second order partial derivatives. So if you have a function of x, y, uh, then the four possible second order partial derivatives are and before I go any further, uh, these are like second derivatives. Uh, so we know how to do second derivatives. These are second order partial derivatives. And here they are. Uh, the first one, I read that as the partial with respect to x, then with respect to x again. The one below that, I read that as the partial with respect to x, then with respect to y. Um, 
third one I read as partial with respect to y, then with respect to y. And then the last one I read as the partial with respect to y, then with respect to x. Uh, the bottom two are also, they're, they're sometimes called mixed partial derivatives because you're doing, I mean, you're doing it with respect to x, then with respect to y, or with respect to y, then with respect to x. So sometimes you might hear me call those mixed partial derivatives. Uh, the key is I, I always focus on the subscript notation. You do everything from left to right. So if you see a mixed partial um, and the subscript is x, y, that means you are going to first differentiate with respect to x. Take that result and differentiate with respect to y. Or if you see y, x, you first compute the partial with respect to y and then differentiate that result with respect to x. So the subscript notation, you know, it tells us what to do. So, hey, these being able to do second partials, you're going to see the importance of it uh, in the next section uh, when we uh, when we start talking about optimizing functions. Um, so it's just a skill that we're going to see is important in the next section. And because of that, you know, we're going to have an example here. Uh, where we're going to find all four second ordered partial derivatives for the function of xy, uh, which equals e to the xy minus y ln x. Uh, this is a doozy. Uh, this one is um, it, it's going to be uh, probably our most difficult example in this section. Uh, but after we do it, I'm sure I'm sure I'll have you do an easier homework problem to practice, and then uh, uh, we'll see how you did on it. So write it down, be prepared, because it's time to head off to the chalkboard and crank through this beastie. All right, here we go. We're going to compute uh, all four second order partial derivatives here. So we're going to compute the partial with respect to x, the partial with respect to y. In order to compute the partial with respect to x and then with respect to x, the partial with respect to y and then with respect to y, and then the mixed partials uh, with respect to xy and with respect to yx. So let's start off by getting the partial with respect to x. So when you do the partial with respect to x, you treat y as a constant. So we have e to the xy. Now y is a constant. We know derivative of e to whatever is, well, e to whatever. Now the chain rule. We have to do the derivative of the exponent. You're treating y as a constant. y is a constant. So the derivative of xy is just y. Now let's move to the next term. Uh, y ln x. Now you know, you know we're going to treat y as a constant. Well, what's the derivative of ln x? That's right, it's 1 over x. So y times 1 over x it's just y over x. And I'm actually, I'm actually going to rewrite y over x as y times x to the negative 1. The reason why is for the second order partial derivatives. To do the partial with respect to x and then with respect to x. You know, hey, remember, um, yeah, you know, I had it on the slide and I mentioned it. If you see something like this, you always look at the subscripts and you go from left to right. So the partial, what this says is you first do the partial with respect to x. After you get the partial with respect to x, and differentiate that with respect to x. So here's the partial with respect to x. Now we're going to differentiate this mess with respect to x. So again, we're going to treat y as a constant. So y is a constant, y is a constant. So when we do this derivative, y is a constant, we should get uh, the constant times e to the xy times the chain rule, the derivative of the exponent. Well, we know the derivative of the exponent is y. Move to the next term. Y is a constant. We're doing it with respect to X again. We're treating Y as a constant. So you differentiate that X to the negative 1. 
The negative 1 comes out front, subtract 1 from the exponent. When that negative 1 comes out front, well, the minus negative 1, that'll make it a plus y times x to the negative second. That's the second partial with respect to x. While we're here, why don't we go ahead and compute the mixed partial? And again, partial with respect to x, then with respect to y. That means you do the partial with respect to x first. You take that result and differentiate it with respect to y. So here's our partial with respect to x. Now we're going to differentiate it with respect to y. So when we differentiate this beastie with respect to y, we're going to treat x as a constant. So here we go. We're going to treat x as a constant. It looks like, uh, well, see, the derivative of y is 1. 1, so that gives us e to the xy. Then plus y e to the xy times x. I was like, wait a minute, where in the world is this coming from? Well, actually, it's coming from our product rule. That when we're doing the partial with respect to y, this first term does require the product rule. Because we have a y times e to the xy. I see y here and I see y up here. So let's review the product rule. Derivative of y is 1. So that's why we have 1 times e to the xy plus y times, I mean, remember, it's the derivative of the first function times the second function plus the first function times the derivative of the second function. The derivative of e to the xy is e to the xy. Chain rule, derivative of the exponent. Since you're doing it with respect to y, you're treating x as a constant. That's why we have times x. Move to the last term. You're differentiating this term with respect to y, so you're treating x as a constant. The derivative of y is 1, so that's just minus x to the negative first. That's a lot of work there. Hey, we now need to do the second partial with respect to y, and then the mixed partial with respect to y, x. So, I better come over here and get the partial with respect to y. So remember, when you do the partial with respect to y, you're going to treat x as a constant. So the first term, e to the xy, that derivative is e to the xy, e to the xy. Now you have to differentiate the numer or the uh, exponent, the chain rule, the derivative of xy. You're treating x as a constant. So that just gives you an x. And, oh, you know what, I always like to write it. I always like to write that constant in front, that x there in front. Okay, minus, you're doing the derivative with respect to y, so you treat x as a constant. So this term here is a constant. The derivative of y is 1, so you just have minus 1 times ln x. All right, so the second partial with respect to y. So we have the partial with respect to y here. Now we're going to differentiate this with respect to y again. So remember, wherever you see an x, you're treating it as a constant. So you see an x, you treat it as a constant. x, that's a constant. So we have x e to the xy, because the derivative of e to the xy is e to the xy, times now the derivative of the exponent, derivative of the exponent, you're treating x as a constant. So x is a constant, the derivative of y is 1, so you're just left with 1 times x, or x. And then, uh, well, that's it, because you're treating x as a constant. So the natural log of x is a constant, and the derivative of a constant is 0. So... Oh, we have to do the other mixed partial. Sorry, kind of zoned out a little bit. Partial with respect to y, then with respect to x. So you do y, then with respect to x. So here it is with y. 
Now you do it with respect to x. When you do it with respect to x, you're now going to treat y as a constant. You have a product rule here, folks. Product rule. You know, now here's an x and up here's an x. Derivative of x is 1, so the derivative of the first function times the second. Plus the first function, x, times the derivative of the second, z to the xy, times y, because the derivative of the exponent is y. Remember, partial with respect to x now, treating y as a constant. Derivative of x is 1, 1 times y is y. And then minus the derivative of ln x, just barely fit it on the board, is 1 over x. Hey, look at this real quick. Look at the partial with respect to xy. Compare that with the partial respect to yx. And they look the same, don't they? I mean, e to the xy, e to the xy, plus, plus, y e to the xy times x. I think that's the same thing as x e to the xy times y. Here's a minus 1 over x. Here we have minus x to the negative first, but isn't that just 1 over x? Frequently, not always, frequently, this is true, that this mixed partial equals this mixed partial. That's not always true, but frequently it is. Right, to make sure you understand getting partials and second partials and mixed partials, I do want you to try one problem right now. Uh, I'd like you to try number 49. I don't think it's quite as nasty as this one. So why don't you go ahead and try number 49. Pause the video. Try 49. Once you've done 49, well, you know the drill. Restart the video and I'll be here cranking through the solution. All right, number 49, you're asked to find all four uh, second partial derivatives. So let's get started by finding the partial with respect to x. And partial with respect to x, you treat y as a constant. So you get 6x minus 6x squared, that's the constant, y squared plus a 6x squared. Ah, you yeah, know, that's pretty cool. So let's get the partial with respect to x again. So the second partial with respect to x, that means we take our partial with respect to x, differentiate it with respect to x, so we treat y's as a constant. So we get a 6 minus a 12xy squared plus a 12x. Yeah, that's pretty good. And, oh, while I'm here, let's do the partial with respect to x now. Let's take the partial with respect to x and differentiate it with respect to y. So that means we're going to treat x's as a constant. So this would be 0, and this would be 0. So it looks like I'll just have a negative. See, this is a constant. Bring the 2 out front, so I make it a 12x squared y. That's not too bad. Let's do the y's now. Take a little break here. Partial with respect to y. So I look at my original beastie. Doing the partial with respect to y, I treat x as a constant. So the derivative of this first term is 0, and the derivative of the last term is 0. So it looks like, uh, see, x is being treated as a constant. The 2 comes out front. It looks like we'll have a negative 4 x cubed y. That's not bad at all. Now let's do the partial with respect to y again. We're going to treat x as a constant. So x is a constant. All this is a constant. The derivative of y is 1. So the constant times 1 is negative 4x cubed. That's pretty sweet. Now we do this mixed partial. So here's our partial with respect to y. We want to take that and now differentiate it with respect to x. So we look up here, we're going to differentiate it with respect to x, so we treat y as a constant. It looks like we'll have a negative 12x squared y. 
And once again, folks, these mixed partials are equal. Remember, that does not always happen. It just happens frequently, but not always. So, hey, hopefully you got that for number 49. Um, that concludes this video here, section 8.3 on partial derivatives and uh, uh, second order partial derivatives. So, at this time, hopefully you feel well equipped to, to start the homework, take your time in it, do the homework. Hopefully you have a, a great time with the homework. It doesn't cause you too many difficulties. Thanks for watching.